we are in what is known in the Hebrew as the first Toledoth of 11 out of the book of Genesis. Moses, when he wrote the book of Genesis, he wrote it in two manuscripts. Most people don't pay any attention to that. But the first manuscript was about creation. It was 1-1 one, one through 2-3. The second manuscript picked up at 2-4 and went to the end of the book, 526. Uh, 50, 26, went to the end of the book of, yeah. and he wrote from 2, 4 to the 50th, from the second chapter, verse 4, to the end of chapter 50, he wrote that entire section in 11 Toledos. You can identify a Toledoth in the English language. In the New American Standard, it's introduced by the words account or generations. You can find it every time that way. Now, I've done a study of that. I've introduced our people to all the 11. And if, you, you're, if you're interested in it, you could always go back to our website and pick up the Bible study on the, the Toledoths. But if you have a, a King James Bible, it would be, if it's a New American, if it's a if it's a new King James, it would probably be the history or generations. Or if you have an old King James, it would just be called the generations, which is a good translation. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, I studied Hebrew, so I like to use Hebrew stuff. <laughs> I didn't go to school to learn it, not to use it. All right. So. Uh, so when, when we, when, and the, the first Toledoth is Genesis 2-4, and it goes to the end of the fourth chapter. That's the first one. And what it does, what Moses is trying to do is to show you as the human race comes into development through Adam and Eve and then through the children and on and on. What he's trying to show you how the plan of God is moving throughout human history. And he uses this idea of generations, the accounting of generations, and he picked out 11 of them and followed them. Pretty interesting. That's a pretty interesting way to read it. We don't read it that way because we just read it in chapters and stuff, but you will find a whole new way of looking at, at the writing of Moses in the book of Genesis if you would do that. Well, so we've been in this study. We've been in Toledoth 1 for a pretty good while. Now we're in the fourth chapter, and we, we, last week we looked at the first seven verses. I want to go back to 3 and 4, because I want to teach a very important subject that has been missed in the Christian church. The doctrine of the perfect timing in the plan of God. Perfect, say this in your head, not with your lips, in your head. Perfect timing in the plan of God. Maybe you haven't even thought about it. And it's probably one, one of the key doctrines that you should be thinking about every day. Because every day your, your life is involved in it. And you don't even pay any attention to it. So, I want you to look at verse 3, 4, and 5. Now I'm going to do a short study. So it came about in the course of time. Whoa. You have no idea. In the English, they, I don't even know what you, what you, how you would even interpret that. But I'm going to tell you in the Hebrew, it's dynamite. And I'm going to give it to you in a minute. That's an idiom. That's a Hebrew idiom of a special phrase. It came about in the course of time. Who sets the course of time? <laughs> Did you know that your life is involved in a time set of a course? Kind of like going to college or going to school. What courses are you taking? How long do you have to take them? Did you know that's what he's talking about? Let's look at it again. 
and it came to pass. Do you know that the course of God, the course of time that God has set for your life will come to pass? And you need to be able to see it when it comes and you need to participate in it. Does everybody understand that you have a course of time? Now, do you understand that it's going to come to pass? All right. That's, this is just biblical stuff. Now watch. So it came about in the course of time, and he's going to mention two people. They could have, we could have put your names there because are you? Do you have a course of time? And will things come to pass in that course of time? Mm -hmm. Half the time you're asleep and miss them because you're not looking for it. You don't even realize it. And so Cain brought an offering to the Lord. I'm going to talk about that next week. What the, what the one event in the course of time that was, we, we have many, but this is one. Uh, he brought an offering. Abel on his part also brought the firstlings of the flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for, for Abel and for his offering and for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. Now next week I'm going to talk about that. But this week, I'm going to talk about your life. Your life, the moment you believe, listen to me now, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't care what age it was, you stepped into God's course of time. That's the plan of God. That's the plan of God. You stepped into the plan of God. Whether you knew it or not, boom, there you are. Da, 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 da. There you are. And he's going to begin to show you events and, and things along your life and the way, right, that's going to come to pass. And you're either going to be joyous about it like Abel or you're going to be a mad as an old wet hen. Well, uh, a spoiled watermelon keeping... Forget it. <laughs> it's not worth even going back to explain it. So, so what we want to look at, this special phrase, in the course, so it came to pass in the course of time, is a special phrase, I wrote this uh, in the third paragraph, it is a special phrase used in the Hebrew as an idiom. This idiom identifies a long-awaited time with events of something special that's going to happen to these two sons and your life. Because this course of time has been set is the plan of God. You enter it at salvation and God has things planned out. And they come to your life in perfect timing. It's called, and it happens. All right? And if you really understand it and are along for it, then it can be a joy ride. And if not, it could be a terrifying ride. Well, well, I understand you. In the case of Cain and Abel, this is going to involve the second rite of passage. The first rite of passage in the Hebrew is a, is a child's career. That's a rite of passage. Well, I had it when I grew up. Listen, when I grew up, my family alerted me by the time I got to the 11th grade. When you graduate, you got four choices. And one, is, one of them is not home. <laughs> you, can get a, you can get a vocational idea. Now, if you're not going to go to college, get into vocation right now in school. Get a vocation, get a, get a job, go to the army, go to college. What do you think the fourth one was? What? I, somebody's mumbling. Speak up. All right, well, apparently nobody here is, no, nobody fourth, had, had a fourth option. I guess my, my family was the only one that gave me a fourth option. 
Uh, I didn't take it, by the way. Farming. We were farmers. I couldn't wait to get off that farm. You talk about hard work. Well, when I went to town and got a job, I could have slept and done it compared to what I did on the farm. Well, the, the first right, the second right that we're dealing with in our passage, the second right of passage is spiritual birth. <laughs> and what that offering was all about was spiritual birth. One accepted, one accepted the gospel and one rejected it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to teach it next week. Yeah. You can read about it. Genesis 3.15, Luke 3.20. I put all this on your paper for you to look at. Abel got saved. Cain didn't. Watch this. Satan. <laughs> Satan. Killed two with one bullet. We had Adam and Eve, and we got, we got Cain and Abel. Two in the lineage of Christ. And he got them both. He's a... He, he. You need to take him serious, but not more serious than Jesus. Got them both. Well, how do you know that, Ron? I, did, I read chapter 4 and he's not there. I know. He's in first, he's hiding. He's in first John 3, 12, though. He, he got them both with one shot. You didn't write it down. Yeah, you know, well, don't fuss with me then. I gave you how he got them with one shot. I want to tell you three things today. This special idiom it shall come to pass in the course of time. This special idiom in Genesis 4.3 became the theology of the perfect timing and the plan of God in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11. We studied that last week. You know, there's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time, right? You miss, you, but you miss verse 1. <laughs> you miss verse 1. Oh, yeah, I know there's a time for this and time for that. You know why? Those are the events in the course of time. Come on. Do you, do you not see when you read Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11, you're looking at the events? He calls them events. You're looking at the events in the course of time. There's time to be this and time to Watch this. I know you missed it. So we're going to go back. Let's go. To, if you can find Ecclesiastes. Right? Look for Ecclesiastes. It's around Solomon, you know, and all that. Right? So reach over there and grab that thing. If you can't find look, if you can't find it, just look in the front of your Bible. It gives you it gives you a page number. Ecclesiastes has a page number. Well, you can you can, you can pass right through uh, this pretty quick, can't you? I missed it a couple of times trying to find it. Well, I finally found it in my Bible. It's on page 1051. But well, we know how that works, don't we? <laughs> we know that don't work at all. But watch this. Here's how he introduces that in the third chapter, verse 1. Now watch this. And what this is, it's the theology of the idiom that's declared in Genesis 4.3. There is an appointed time for everything. There is a time for every event under heaven. Here's what it actually says. There's an appointed time and, a, and an appropriate time. It says there is, a, there is an appointed time and an appropriate time. I ought to write that down. This is your life. <laughs> I'm talking about your life. There is an appointed time 
And when it says, and there is a time for every event, he's talking about an appropriate, an appointed time and an appropriate time. Here's the course of time, and there are going to be events. They're going to have two things attached to him. One is an appointed time. You can mark that on your calendar. There are time to be born and time to die. And an appropriate time. Listen to me. When this thing comes, when God get it, he always tells you ahead of time what he's going to do. It may be a little vague to you because you're a little vague. When it comes, it has nothing to do with your circumstances. It doesn't have anything to do the way it might play out in your life. But it's important how it plays out in the life of God in his plan. Did you get that? Mm. Did you write it down? There's two things. You got an, you got an appointed time. That's, a, that's going to be a time event. You can mark it down your calendar. There's an appropriate time. It's going to hit whether you like it or not, whether you think this is a good time or not a good time. Circumstances that surround this when he says now has nothing to do with that moment, that event. Did you get that? Mm. It's coming your way. He's going to knock on your house. Okay? There's an appointed time. You can mark it on your calendar. And there's an appropriate time. It may fit or it may not fit your circumstances. Right? But it will fit God's will. It will, fit, it will always fit. If it's the plan of God, and it is, it will always fit the will of God. Where do you find the will of God? The Word of God. If you don't study the Word, you're not going to get the will. The Word, the will, to the work. <clears throat> All right? It will fit God's scheme. It may not fit yours. It will fit God's life. It may not fit yours. So who has to adjust? God adjusts to your life? You adjust to God's life. Stop. Well, thank you. We're, we're going to adjust to God's. All right. Well, at least I got one person. All right. See, see now we, 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 when Solomon comes along, he takes that, that idiom and throws it into theology, doesn't it? In a way that it, we understand there's time to be born and time to die, time this, time that. Right? You can mark them on calendars, right? But they always occur in the appropriate time. Abraham couldn't understand that. Maybe you can't either. Right? You told me when I when I could when I could actually have sex and enjoy it. You told me I could I was going to have a baby. Now look at me. I can't even spell it anymore, let alone have it. And now you tell me we're going to have a baby. I'm 100 years old. My wife is 90. Hello. Is anybody home? In the course of time, it'll happen. So who has to adjust? Well, I guess I'll have to pick another couple. They just don't seem to be up for the task. So what's he do? He does a miracle. Does he do a miracle? Well, I don't know. He'd have to do about three or four on me. I don't know what he's done. All right. Point number two, the believer must be taught his volitional responsibility to engage in the perfect timing and the plan of God by inhale, exhale. 
Pay attention to this now. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. When the Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed. You know what breathe is? It's inhale, exhale. Well, hold your breath till the class is over. <laughs> and we'll have a living example of it. It's inhale, exhale. I mean, have you ever played football and got hit so hard it took the breath away from you? You thought you were going to die. Why? Because you couldn't get your breath. And the coach comes over and says, you're all right. <laughs> right? You're all right. Shake it off. You're all right. You'll be good. All right. Get back in there. What you, you lazy? Come on. I got that. So here's the point. There's mechanics to this. The mechanics of inhale, exhale. The inhale, exhale. You know, we, we teach this as faith cycle. We see the inhale is hear it, learn it, and believe it. The exhale is apply it, and God will bring it to pass. I put it on the bottom of your paper for, for you to look at. Now watch. I'm going to give you a story out of the Bible that this ought to knock it straight home. Right? So, you got your Bibles. Go to Genesis, the 37th chapter of Genesis. I'm going to show you something. There's a, there are a lot of illustrations in the Bible of this principle I'm giving you, the perfect timing and the plan of God. But I'm giving you one that's just unique. I'm in the 37th chapter verses 12 through 28, and then verse 36. Now, most of you are familiar with it. If you've been around the church a while growing up, you, you've heard you, everybody. Who doesn't love Joseph? Right? Story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is just a magnificent story. I picked a segment out of his life to show you this principle of the perfect time. In the course of time, events will occur in the plan of God that are important to your life in ways that maybe you could have never figured it that way. So let me tell you the story. You can read about it later. Let me just tell you the story, and then you can read about it, and you can pay attention to it. So let me just tell you. The brothers, they, the, the family lives at... Hebron. They live at Hebron. And the, all the boys, except the, the, two, the two younger ones, Joseph and Benjamin, the rest of the boys have been sent to tend the sheep at Shechem. A, a pretty good distance from home. And the father's concerned because he hasn't heard any news from him any, well, for a while. And so his father's concerned about their well-being. I wonder if everything's going okay. So he says to Joseph, I'm going to send you down to check on the boys uh, at Shechem. Go down and check on them and see if everything's going okay and give me a report. So he does. He says, okay, Dad, I, I will do that. When he gets to Shechem, there's nobody there. <laughs> there's a man... And, and so he starts hunting. He starts hunting around. See, well, maybe I'm in the wrong part of Shechem. And so he, he's going around. He can't find him anywhere in Shechem. And he runs across accidentally. A man who lived there. And he said to the man, now he's all lost. He don't know. He says to the man, did you see a bunch of guys with a bunch of, bunch of sheep? Uh, he Hebrew people. I can't find them. They, you would think that'd be, they'd be easy to find. <laughs> you know what I mean? It seems like they'd be easy to find. A, a large, large group and a lot, a lot of people. That seems like they'd be easy to find. It seems like they'd be easy to find. He says, yeah, I remember. Yeah. They went to Dothan. You ever been to Dothan? No. 
They, they, <laughs> Pam says, I'm from there. He goes, Dothan. Yeah, he says, you, you just go down the trail and take a right and a left, and, you, and you'll be there. Yeah, all right. All right. Now watch. Watch what I put on your paper. That's point A. Do you see perfect timing in the plan of God at work in the life of Joseph? Can you see that? It was. The course of time was moving a, 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 a towards a fulfillment to, bring, to begin a fulfillment in the plan of God of, of certain events that was important to move human history forward in the plan of God. But do, you see, do you see the hand of God in the midst of that? Suppose that little old man hadn't been there. Oh, it's just coincidence. Nah, nah, nah. Poo. Nah. So, as soon as the brothers see him coming to Dothan, well, as soon as they saw him coming, listen what they did. They plot to kill him. Oh, that's a happy family. They plot to kill him. That's mob mentality. I put this passage down. Reuben, one of the brothers, interceded on behalf of Joseph and said, let's not kill him. Let's just put him in a dry well, water well that's dry. And uh, if he makes it, he makes it. If he doesn't, then it's not our fault that he died. He fell in a well and drowned. Well, I don't it says, but, so, but what he was really wanting to do, Reuben, well, why didn't you do it to start with if you really wanted? What I really want to do is when all this quiets down, I'll circle back and I'll get them out and take them home. It's funny, though. The human plans never work that way. And one of the ways they never work that way is because God has got this. This course of time that they're all in is run by God, not by man. You understand that? Well, you will. You will if you stay with this program here, right here. You'll understand it. Reuben intercedes. After, after putting Joseph in the dry well, they throw him down into the dry well, a group of slave traders stopped on their way to Egypt. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And they go like, would you like to buy a human slave? Well, yes, I would. That's our business. What would you give me? Uh, the coat doesn't go with him. The coat's not for sale. But just the raw naked person without the coat. What would you give me for him? Ah, you know, being good Jews, they're all going to do this. Now I give you, yeah, yeah. They settled on 20 silvers, 20 pieces of silver. I ask you a question. Do you see the perfect timing and the plan of God working in the life of Joseph? How are things going, Joseph? Well, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Other than that, why? Well, what do you think about being sold into slavery? Well, it's better being dead, but what do I know? You know what Joseph has in his head? God's got it. This is how simple this is. My life belongs to God. Write this down, John 10, 28 through 30. I'm in the hands of God. I'm in the hands of Christ who's in the hands of God and nobody, no man can take me out of the hands of God without permission. And that, see how simple this is? When you know God. Look how simple this was. The slave traders don't own me. 
I've been bought with the price of Calvary. I've been bought by the blood of Christ. Nobody owns me. Nobody owns me. I'm still alive. If I was dead, I'd be better off. But I'm still alive and no man owns me. Yeah, but you've been sold for 20 pieces of silver. Hmm. I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. This sounds like a wonderful field trip for him, doesn't it? Anybody want to go? Anybody want to join up and follow Joseph? Huh? Anybody want to leave your sweet little job you got and join up with him? Going to slave as a slave person to Egypt to be sold on the slave market? Huh? Huh? You'd be smart to want to go, wouldn't you? But who knew this was the course of God? This looked like a bad deal going, right? This is like a bad deal getting worse. It wasn't. This is the course of time moving and events are happening, moving that course of events in the plan of God. The slave traders, <laughs> the slave traders brought Joseph from Dothan to Egypt. I don't know what he sold them for. I bet it was more than 20 pieces of silver, don't you? When he could say, well, he's educated and He's this and he's that. And look at his teeth. I guess they... Maybe they looked at him like a horse. 20 pieces of silver and sold him. Listen, they're bidding on him. I'll take that young, good-looking guy. No, no, no. One guy said, look, let's stop the bidding. Stop the bidding, I got him. Everybody went, who is that? Potiphar. Potiphar who runs the, he's the head of the security of Pharaoh, the most powerful king in the world. <laughs> Do you see, Joseph dropped into the course of time in the plan of God, and his life is moving according to events that is moving God's plan moving the human race towards a fulfillment. And he's been carried away and swept by God in this great movement. The slave traders. God's plan, watch this now. I'm going to show you the plan of God that he's, been, he's involved in, right? He's dropped in on. The day that Potiphar bought him, they started counting, God counted 430 years to bring what he had started with Joseph to fulfillment. The very day that Joseph was sold into slavery into Egypt, God began to count at that point 430 years down the pike. Moving human history forward to when he would take a family and make a nation out of them and out of a nation a savior. I'm telling you, the course of time is still as prevalent as it ever has been and you need to be able to see this. Watch this. Exodus, the 12th chapter, 40 and 41. Now the time that the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. Now watch this. Because if you think that God is not concerned in, in the calendar of time as well as what has to be accomplished, watch this. And at the end, watch this now, and at the end of 430 years to the very day. <laughs> All the host of the lords went out from the land of Egypt. They, God moved. The course of time was moving and events were occurring. 
at appointed times and in appropriate ways to move the plan of God forward in human history. And Joseph was part of that great movement. And so are you. And so are you. But do you, can you see it? Can you see that? Do you not know that that course of time is there? It's always been there. It was there with Adam. It was there with Abraham. It was there with Jesus Christ. It's there with you. You are in, in the plan of God. You are in the plan of God in that course of time. And you need to pay attention to it. It has nothing to do with the circumstances, right? Joseph, was Joseph ever in control of any of this? His dad said, I want you to go. And he went. He got lost. The guy said, well, I know where they are. They're over there. He went over there. They tried to get me. Hey, you know, who's in charge of this? God. And God is moving things, and he's using people who are prepared for the moment. I got to quit. I got to quit. I mean, you're starting to get in Jack's time. I don't want to do that. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break there about. And come on back. When we tell you to get back, hurry back up here for Jack. Jack Swan out of Rome, Georgia. Uh, Pastor. Oh, we got it. we've got to take an offering first. I'm sorry. Let's take an offering. Let's take an offering. And uh, let's have prayer. We'll take an offering. Then you'll be dismissed and be back. And then Jack will take us out of here. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us. Thank you for the Eucharist today. Father, while you tarry, we work. We need to be evangelical, Father. We need to share the gospel with people. We need to tell people the truth and how to be actively engaged with God in the course of time. In our course of time. All the events that are occurring, can we see God at work? Take this offering, Father, and use it to your glory. We don't want to spend much on ourselves. We want to spend it on getting the gospel across the world in Jesus' name. Amen.